if they say that, then I would like them to criticize Venezuela. I mean, because if you think the optimum amount of economic freedom is Sweden, then Venezuela is a long way from that. And yet, if you listen to leftists, uh, liberals, like whatever the word, you know, uh, you hear not a peep of criticism from that crowd about Venezuela. So I'm not quite sure how, how ingenuous <coughs> that they really are about that story. But that's another good point. Yes, sir. In regards to the uh, the sharp drop in the freedom of property rights, what has exactly been the biggest cause to that, and what can be done to make it, I guess, rise again? Well, the question is about what the, what's the cause of those the for property rights declines. Well, I mean, I have nine variables there, and five of the nine crossing over two distinct different sources are have really dropped a lot. And it's uh, the subjective variables from the World Economic Forum having to do with uh, impartial courts. Uh, there's a general question on property rights. There's also a question on, on this is kind of related to what I said about police. Uh, there's a question on the eff efficacy of, the, of police enforcing, you know, sort of law and order. And those are just going down a lot too. Those are kind of, sort of subjective and survey based. I actually do believe them though because uh, they're very US specific. Other countries, the same survey is not happening there and so on. Um, so that, that, that's basically the story. Unfortunately, those, those data that we use, are not directly linked to a particular policy. So I can't actually say, well, it's it's the Kilo decision, the Supreme Court decision, or it's the having to take your shoes off at the airport, or it's accident forfeiture. I have these things in my head, but I can't directly link it to it. Now, I, to answer your question, what can be done about it, though, um, that's where I really do worry. Spending is easy. I mean, fiscal crises come and go. Governments spend too much, that's what politicians do. Greek politicians, Italian politicians, Politicians spend money, okay, good, I, I know this. And then they get right up to some kind of fiscal cliff, use that stupid term. And they look over, and usually they go, I don't want to do that, they, they fix things. I mean, and, and technologically speaking, it's not hard to, to, to fix budget crises. You just don't spend so much, you know, maybe you tax a little bit more, you don't spend so much, you know, you just be sane. It's not impossible to imagine Congress fixing the fiscal problem. How do you fix property rights? You just write a new law saying, oh, from here on forward, we have better property rights. No, you know, it's, property rights are deeply embedded in the culture and the daily practice of business and, 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 uh, and government officials. And how do you undo the memory of President Obama stealing millions of dollars from Chrysler GM bondholders? You don't pay this. That, that was done. It was done in an extra legal way. Argentinians blushed, frankly, the way that was said. <laughs> and yet, for even the Argentinians out there. But uh, the, how do you fix that? It's like Humpty Dumpty, how do you put that together again? So I really do worry that we've, we've, we've crossed over a, a sort of a, a, a really deep divide now. I don't know how we get back. I'm not worried about spending. I am, but in, in context, I'm not worried about it anywhere near like I ain't worried about the erosion of property rights. Uh, go here. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think the impact of the cost of higher education and the debt associated with it is going to have on uh, economic freedom? The question is about higher education and the cost and its impact. I don't think it's going to impact my numbers as such. I think it's a real problem, though. I think that the, the market economies experience uh, what should be called, you know, creative destruction. And I think the education system in the country is uh, ready for a lot of creative destruction. I, I say that as a privileged professor at a school that charges about $55,000 a year. Um, I think that the, the system is, is, going, is, is going to be attacked and in a lot of ways successfully attacked by technology. And the the value proposition of a student taking $100,000 in loans uh, is, to go to college is, is, is quickly eroding. It's mainly because the, there are going to be cheaper, more effective ways to credential yourself and to acquire the human capital that you want uh, without giving SMU or even the University of Illinois as much money. Um, uh, my fallback position is to become a bartender, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, 
But no, I, I don't think it's going to be this freedom thing. Actually, it's the kind of thing that you should see. Economically free societies allow for that kind of churn, that kind of dynamic entrepreneurial activity. Uh, what I'm worried about, actually, is that the, the politicians are going to try to prop up these dinosaur systems of higher education. And I'm, again, I'm a proud member of one. I'm, I'm the one guy, I'm the first one who's going to get cut off. Uh, and, uh, but I think the, 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 the politicians are going to try to prop up and subsidize the, these systems uh, and turn them into sort of elaborate job programs for geeks like me. And I hope that doesn't come. I, hope, I mean, if universities can survive the market test, more power to them. But I think that there's going to be a real powerful test coming. It is coming. Khan Academy, uh, there's all kinds of good stuff coming along. I'm very excited. We just had a whole seminar on this SMU, actually, that I organized on the challenges. To education. Um, I also think it's true at the lower level as well. I think the uh, there's a guy named James Tooley, who's a British British education professor. He is uh, studying and now in the business of creating a system of low cost private schools all around the world in the worst slums uh, in the world, the worst slums of Lagos, Nigeria, the worst slums you can find. Literally, people living on garbage heaps. And they're creating, for 50 cents a day, you can send your kid to school, and those kids are outperforming the government schools by multiple orders of magnitude. So I think that this, and they're doing it with technology. They're doing it because you can put a $200 laptop in front of a kid, and he can learn like a kid can in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's changing the whole world in a positive way. In a way, it's going to just, I think, going to destroy a lot of the edifice that we, we all have enjoyed. Sorry. Um, Okay, I'm, about, I'm going to take two or three more young ladies that are very patient. Do you also account for uh, black money and corruption here in the index? Okay, the, we have nothing in the index about corruption, per se, but the index correlates very well with corruption. And as you might imagine, countries with more economic freedom have a lot less corruption. So there's nothing in the index structurally that includes that, but there have been a lot of studies that have been done by scholars who study corruption, and they find, as you might expect, there's a negative relationship. Yes, sir. What do you think the, um, the free trade agreement with companies or with countries that have a lower production cost than us, how do you think that affects uh, long-term unemployment within America? I don't think it affects long-term unemployment at all. The question is, uh, how does trade with, with low-cost countries affect unemployment? I don't think it affects it at all. In fact, the evidence of that is, is clear. I mean, there's no, there's no difference between trade with low-wage uh, low, uh, countries and, say, a new, uh, new invention. I mean, the silly example, but it's a good example, is, uh, you know, the automobile put buggy whip makers out of business. Uh, and, and all the people that made buggy whips, all the people that made wagons, they all, within a generation, had to go find new work. Tens of thousands of American people had to go, and, and they did. There's no evidence that long-term unemployment trends correspond to those kinds of, of challenges. Now, that's not to minimize the, the microeconomic challenge for individuals involved. Uh, and, uh, you know, trash that, you know, if you're the one that's losing your job to a low wage competitor, that is a, a, absolutely a serious challenge. And I say that some of the family members who are, are in that situation. Um, but you have to remember, we don't make our country richer or prosperous by not trading with other people. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and in the long run, the country is going to be more prosperous in the long run. We have more jobs if we allow that process to take place, even though I admit it's it is a painful process. Last question, and then we'll, and I'll be up here also for private questions if we want to do something like cash flow after. If you had to pick like which variable on your index that you've seen as the biggest influence on countries that were lower on your index, gain the most um, progress, which variable would you have to pick? That's a great question. Um, the question is, which of the area or variables of the index have contributed the most towards countries getting better on the index? Okay. Um, you know, the things you can do quickly tend to be those mechanical things like tax policy. So if you want to, if, you know, uh, a lot of the Eastern European countries after the Soviet Union broke up. Now the Soviets did have a tax system, and it was horrible. I mean, for every dollar you earned, you know, 75 cents went to of the state. Um, and of course, they gave you all kinds of goodies. They, they weren't worth anything. But anyway, the, um, so the like Slovakia and, and Poland and, and, and Hungary, they inherited these horribly terrible tax systems. 
and most of the federal taxes are very low in flat rates. Russia did that. Russia's income tax rate is 13% flat, total flat tax. So that was one of the things you could do very quickly, because all it all takes is a new piece of legislation, change tax rate, boom. Tariff rates are also like that. You can very quickly lower tariff rates. Tax rates, tariff rates. Monetary policy you can fix quickly. Uh, so if you have a real big inflation problem like Zimbabwe had, you can very quickly fix that just by not printing so much money so quickly. The things that, so the countries that have gone out very quickly have done so in those sort of areas where we have a, the, the, the technological ability within the political system to just very quickly make changes. The things that have been slow, though, the, the, opposite, you know, the opposite question, though, is what's slow, and that's that property rights stuff. Getting, getting judges to be impartial, getting the courts to be independent of the, of the executive, getting property rights and for contracts and courts efficiently. All of that, that's the stuff that a lot of resources go into, but it, it's really hard to, to improve on those margins. But there is improvement. There's actually a, a really slow and steady improvement in the, in the legal system, property rights system, uh, all around the world. It's uneven, different places better than others, but it's really slow. And so if you look at the area two in numbers that I look at, they don't change so much as the other areas. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Bob, for uh, speaking here. Uh, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for coming out and for remaining for the questions. Some of you will be joining us for dinner. Why don't we let the crowd clear out? Uh, dinner is in room 210. Uh, in, the, in the front part of the building is on the second floor. If you want to go now or if you want to wait a second. Thank you very much.